Have you ever watched movies and wondered how they're able to make you feel like you're really living in the shoes of the characters you're watching and experiencing what they're experiencing? Well, I want to do a little breakdown on this scene from the 2019 movie, The Joker. And it is, first of all, a phenomenal movie, really, really well directed, really well told, a great story well told. And what I like to talk about is telling the story of the Joker and experiencing what he's going through in this scene in the train and how he actually finally transforms into who he's going to become, the actual villain character. So this is a, a very big transformational scene in the movie. It's pivotal from him becoming this sort of laughed at character to a person who takes control of their life in a very dark way. But what I want to talk about specifically is this idea of subjective versus objective storytelling. And I think it's what can make us as storyboard artists or storytellers much better and more focused when we think about where to put the camera so we can tell the stories of the characters that are most important in the movie or in the scene. And one big thing that gets asked every once in a while in movies from directors is, Whose story are we telling? And I've had that asked several times before, or I've heard it asked several times before in meetings, which means that the way the storyboard artist has boarded the scene isn't really being really clear telling a specific character's perspective or their story, especially if it's the hero character. And we want to make sure that we're informing the audience as to what their journey is, what they're experiencing, what they're feeling, so we, the audience, can relate more with their journey. So. One big thing I like to do is figure out where we're going to put the camera. And so by putting the camera near our hero character, almost like a drone, we can follow their journey and we can experience it as if we are them or as if we're sitting with them. And that's really, really important because what's a big part of storytelling? It's learning to show the audience that these characters are the most important ones and making the audience care about the characters and empathize with the characters with what they're going through. So first thing is, let's take a quick little peek here at the layout of our scene here. And this is in Photoshop. We've got our Joker right here. And I'm gonna just do a circle right here. This is our Joker right here. Joker's right there. And we have these three characters coming in here who are the antagonists. And then we have a female character here sitting down who she'll be unfortunately picked on by these guys. And then the Joker will begin laughing and he'll take the attention away so that these guys will forget about her and they'll go over to him. And what I want to do with this top-down view is pay attention to how it's shot. Majority of the shots, here's the camera right here, majority of the shots are shot from his perspective, meaning it's with him, the camera's with him, and that means we, the audience, are with the Joker. We're not sitting with these guys over here. We're sitting over here with a Joker, witnessing as these guys are looking at her and they're um, accosting her and throwing her french fries. The camera tends to be over here filming it. It doesn't go way over here and it doesn't go over here, nor does it really ever turn around and go here. Yes, there are a few shots where we have the camera between the Joker and the assailants or the antagonists or the a-holes, but majority of the shots are shot over here. It's like the director saying, hey everybody in the audience, come on over, get in the train, sit down with us right here and let's experience what's going on with the Joker and what's gonna go on to the Joker with him. So we, we feel like we're with him on the journey and that is a subjective perspective. We're telling his story. We're not telling her story. We're not telling their story. So most of the shots are shot over here. We will see some shots that feel like the camera's been placed over here, but my belief is those shots were done with a really long camera lens and that does compress the characters and it compresses the shot. To, to film these guys, but it's not like the cameraman went like do 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 and I'm gonna shoot you guys right here. So we're gonna look at those shots. The ones that feel compressed is you'll see things like the, the, the bars that, that are uh, where people stand on you know or hold on to, they're gonna be really, really blurry. And that gives me the impression it's probably done in a long lens. There are a few shots, yes, that are between here where the camera does come over to the side and film the Joker as these guys begin to move towards him, but there there, there are not a lot of those. So we'll move forward. So this first shot is Joker sitting on the train from a crappy day. And we've got what I would call the setup. This is our setup shot or our establishing shot of an empty train car. And right now we don't even see this woman down here, but she will be the subject of these jerks coming in. And once she, this lady leaves right here, it'll just be the Joker and this woman here. So pay attention to the storytelling. 
And what's great about this is we never see those guys come in. We hear them, but we don't see them. And what's great about that is that we're experiencing this moment as if we're the Joker. He's not looking at them. So listen. I'm telling you, she wanted my number. She now we can hear voices in the background. We're hearing them just like he would have heard them. He's not looking down towards this end of the train. He's hearing it. And we are the audience are hearing it at the same time. And so guess what that does, everybody? It causes him to look over and as he looks over what's the camera doing the camera is beginning to look with him the audience is watching him look and we're all wondering who's making those voices who's talking and as the joker turns it causes the camera to turn and this is as a side note this is a great way to motivate a camera move by having a character look then the cameraman's going like oh what's he looking at oh i'll just turn my head and we'll see what he's looking at did you see how close we were so look, now we got those guys down there at the end of the train. We never saw them come in. We only heard them as if we were with him. Now that he's looking down here, we take the focus off the Joker. We're in soft focus. We see these guys down here, and we see the woman there by herself. And let's look at his eyes. Watch his eyes as he darts back and forth between the guys. Now we hear this again, we, you want some fries, let's go back a little bit and listen to this. You want some fries? Now they're adding the dialogue as an, a voiceover to the Joker looking. And again, we're hearing these events as if we're the Joker. So we're hearing them ahead of time before we see them. And now we're beginning to see these guys assault the woman and become just complete jerks. Nice so we're looking at this as a very, very soft over the shoulder of the Joker. So we're with them again. We're telling his story. We're telling these events from his perspective. A great example of subjective storytelling. And now as the camera moves over, it's almost like we're watching the Joker look back and forth. And we're looking at this hand reaching out the fries. This action and gesture of the hand reaching out is causing us to want to look over to see who he's actually wanting to offer the fries to. So now this is why the camera moves over. Another great example of motivating a camera move. Hello. And so we're back introducing the Joker. And now look, he's looking forward, watch his eyes dart between the two. He looks back and forth quickly. And then I dart is saying that he's paying attention. He's watching what's happening as it's unfolding. And as the camera cuts back between these two guys, or we're back with the Joker in the foreground. So we're again, we're experiencing the storytelling with him. We're not jumping over there and getting close up to these guys. The other thing I wanted to point out, and this is more of an art direction, costuming, and even a casting decision, is that this guy right here, the tallest guy with Mr. like the old fashioned Gordon Gecko hairstyle from the 80s, from that movie Wall Street, it's slick back. He's the actual, he's actually the worst one. He's like the ringleader. He's the alpha. These other guys are a little goofier. His hair's messed up. This guy's kind of a little heavier, messed up hair. So these guys are like the betas to him being the alpha wolf. And so even in the way they're dressed, our attention is drawn to this guy here as the soon to become perpetrator. So, and the other thing I want to point out, this is not a subjective versus objective storytelling point, but they really do a great job of burying the cuts when the power goes out on the, uh, in the train here. So watch these cuts really here good. between here and now we cut in closer. And these cuts are a great way to sneak up and get closer. But I still feel like because these foreground elements are so blurry, including these poles, it feels like these were shot on a long lens. So we're not necessarily moving the camera between the Joker and these guys, but we're still back with the Joker. But the purpose of these shots, and I, the other big thing we have to realize when we're doing storyboards or we're telling a story is that every cut and every shot is in the movie or in the story for a specific reason. And a great reason for having this close up is to show the expression and show this predatory behavior. And these types of behaviors and these types of expressions aren't gonna be learned and aren't gonna be seen very clearly from that very wide shot. So there is a very good reason to cut in close for this story point. Don't ignore him, he's being nice to you. So now we're getting here, we're focusing on these guys. He throws it over there and then we pan over to her and as he throws it, again, another great way to motivate a camera move. We're following the French fry being thrown. So now, as we pan over and follow the fry going over to our woman, she's looking off at the Joker, almost like, 
please help me. This is a cry for help. She's looking to the one other person in the train, a sympathetic eye to help her. Okay, and we could also interpret this pan over almost like a point of view shot from the Joker. So we are perhaps experiencing this storytelling through the Joker's eyes. Even though her eye line seems to be a little off, she's not looking directly in the camera, but it feels almost like that. <laughs> so now we're cutting to a reverse angle, almost like their eyes are meeting. She's saying, help me, get me the frick out of this train, get, get you know, take care of these jerks, and actually he ends up doing that. But now we cut back to the Joker, and we're gonna rewind just a little bit and watch the sympathetic look from his eyes. He looks back and forth, and then he starts to laugh. And of course, this is the beginning of the end for the other guys. And of course, we know that he has that affliction where he has that nervous laughter when he gets he has anxiety and fear. So this, this begins to draw the attention away from her onto him. So now we're on a reverse. We're with him again. We're telling his story. We're closer on him in general than I think any other of the shots in the scene. Majority of the shots are on his face. They're very, very tight. We're not really that close with those other guys in the background, meaning we're telling his story. So by him turning his head away from her, but also last thing I want to point out, or not of many things, is that by having him turn his head away, he's sort of saying like, I can't answer your call. I'm sorry, I don't have it within me to do this. And we know from the opening of the movie, he got his ass kicked by those jerk kids who took a sign earlier. So he knows he's not up for the task. <laughs> so now we're back on this shot of those guys. We're not necessarily looking through his eyes. But the great thing is we begin to hear the laugh. We have heard other uh, vocal cues or other audio cues earlier on in the scene where we're with the Joker. We hear these guys laughing. We see them. Similarly, we see these guys laughing. We see them being complete assholes to that woman. And the great thing about this shot is that their attention is focused on her. And as we hear the Joker's laughter in the background, their attention now turns to him it gets drawn to him and away from them. So this is a great shot that actually tells that story point very, very clearly. And look, they stop and they look off camera. And now what I love about this shot is they could have clearly and very easily gone to a reverse angle, which means what they could have done is they could have, after that close up, that shot of those bad guys, and I think it's a long lens shot, but let's just say the camera's over here. We're filming those jerks looking at her very predatory, and then they turn to look at the Joker. What they could have done is very easily had the camera whip around like this and gone to a reverse of the Joker right here and shoot the Joker from this angle like this as if we were looking at the Joker from their perspective. They could even have shot an over the shoulder from the, of those guys to see the Joker in the, in the distance. And from one perspective, it could have made it feel like this guy's all alone in the distance, and that could have had actually an interesting feel. And it would look something like this. Joker would be here at the very back. I'm gonna just draw our floor real fast. Here's the wall of the train. These are seats. And our Joker is right here, laughing his butt off. Nervously laughing his butt off. So here he is right here. And those guys, if they wanted to do overs, you could have had one of the, the curly hair guy here looking down like this. So we're telling their story, and I don't know that we would have the woman in the shot, but the point is they didn't do that. They actually, I think brilliantly, chose to go to him in the foreground with those jerks in the background. And I love that because it's not telling their story, it's telling his story. So what do they do? From an effective perspective, what they did is they just said, we're gonna bring the camera back over here like this, and we're gonna to cut to looking at the Joker in the foreground and put these in on a very focused lens so that these guys are all thrown into soft focus in the background. So let's go back to the clip now. <laughs> now he's laughing. Let's cut back there to see what it looks like again from them turning their heads. <laughs> and cutting to the Joker in the foreground, so great. He's trying to cover his mouth. He knows he's gonna get in trouble. And again, we're not shooting on a reverse. We're shooting him here. So we're telling his story with those guys in the background. The other great thing about this shot is that by cutting to this angle and keeping these guys in the background and that woman in the background, it reminds us of where they are in relation to our hero character. So now, what's also great is they've used those electrical outages 
to go to a wider shot on the cut. And that actually establishes where those guys are in relation to the Joker. They did cut to one reverse angle of him laughing. And I don't know if that's just an editorial choice. The director saw, thought that that would be nice. There were, maybe the performance is great. And we cut to one, I would say, neutral shot that isn't from his perspective. This is one of the few ones. But the camera pushes in on these guys and they're looking at him again. And I think what the purpose of those shots is to give enough time for these guys to register what's going on down there so that they can then move forward and become predators. It's something funny, asshole. And this is one of the few shots where the cameraman actually did walk up to that bad guy. One of the very few, one of the very, very, very few where the camera guy went, doop, 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 doop. I'm gonna go shoot the alpha guy here. And you know, that line I think is a, we need to go close on that guy to see his expression and to see that the alpha guy is fully, completely centered on the Joker now for the first time. So one of the very few times when they actually move in close. And also what's great about this is the attention that's being drawn onto the Joker gives the woman a natural out and she's like, I'm gonna get the F out of here. So this wide shot again with him waving them off and saying, no, 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 ignore me, gives her a chance to get out of here. <laughs> and the great thing about that is when they cut to the reverse of the Joker, they still allow the audience to view the woman escaping the scene and that ends her, her moment in the train. We have her getting up right here in the background by cutting to a reverse and him laughing. We see her pass camera we see her past the Joker. Now she's escaped the scene. She's free. She's clear. She's safe. And meanwhile, we can tell the most important story point of the Joker in pain, knowing that, Jesus, man, I am screwed. I'm going to get my butt kicked very soon. So we've told two story points in one shot, which is great. But we're telling his story primarily. So now we're on that reverse angle, a very, very short shot of him laughing in the foreground. We have a, I guess we call it dirty over, where it's very, very soft focusing right here. And now their focus is completely on the Joker. So we're, again, we're telling his story and we're telling the beginning of their predatory behavior moving towards the Joker. And a reaction as they throw the bag, he's reacting to them. So now this shot here, and again, think about this dynamic, the power dynamic. We have the Alpha standing up, his hair slicked back. We've got Gordon Gecko Jr. here. And uh, the gold watch even shows that he might be the Alpha. Hair slicked back, eyes locked. These guys, messy hair, messy hair. They're beneath him. So compositionally, we have this great composition of the bad guy, the aggressor, moving forward, beginning his predatory game. And also pay attention to it being a game of cat and mouse. It's the fun, it's the, it's the playfulness of a cat with a mouse before they go in for the kill. He has this maniacal smile on his face. It will change eventually, but this is the beginning, the appetizer moment before the full meal of the, pred the predator moving in. <laughs> Isn't it rich? So now he begins stalking his prey, and they use these light outages again for these cuts. He's like waving him off. And this is one of the few shots where the cameraman is dolling back with our predator moving forward. As we get in back behind our hero again, so we're telling a story, we see where he is in relation to him. The other great thing about these shots, when we shoot overs and we're very close to being on the camera line, that's one thing we didn't talk about in the opening of the video, but we have a thing called the camera line. And uh, for those that don't know the camera line, it is this invisible line right here that sets up a filming boundary for the camera. And all that means is that as long as the camera stays on this side of this red camera line, these characters will always be represented in their correct places on screen, meaning the Joker will always be on screen left. And these guys will be on screen right. And that just helps maintain this thing called continuity in screen direction and filming. And that's, um, and so by understanding where the camera line is, and the camera line is always between characters having an interaction. So the interactions are between the Joker and these guys, the, the woman right now by this point is gone. So we have the camera line going between these two areas. This, if, if we look at filming and having the opportunity to film characters from any 
position anywhere, basically mean we have a 360 degree filming area. If we cut that area down into a 180 degree filming area, which means on this side of the camera line, then characters will always be represented on the left and the right in their in their uh, correct places. So let's just go back to the video for a second. Meaning all the time, the Joker is always on screen left. These guys are always on screen right because we've maintained the camera's position on the correct side of the camera line. And by the way, comment down below if you actually want to see a video on camera line. So we've got the, the we, they've got bearing a couple of cuts here with the, with the lights going out again to move them tighter, which is very playful and very scary. So we're getting closer and closer to our hero being devoured by these guys. And he feels very alone. So again, we're back with the, the joke in the foreground as these guys are moving down and sitting down around him. A great composition. So now what's nice about in the progression of the storytelling, and I'm getting a little bit off track on the subjective versus objective storytelling, but in the progression of, of their aggression, they're stalking him, and this is the first time one character is actually physically touching the Joker and removing his clown hat. So now by doing that, that is a the level of aggression up and making things worse for our character. And that's very important in a narrative to escalate issues so that they don't just stay at baseline. You have nothing to measure it from. You have no reasons to feel more fear for our guy, but this is the very first time he's been assaulted by these guys. Compositionally, again, we have a low angle shooting up at this guy. His hands are up, he's hanging, he's being playful. He's exposing himself with his arms up. He's not protecting himself. And that sense of vulnerability is something that, that a villain or a thug or a bully will do before they make their big move here. <laughs> and now this guy puts the, the, the wig on and he's blocked by these guys. And they're laughing at him. These cuts again are being buried with the lights going out. And now the aggression changes. <laughs> and great composition again we have this big heavy dark foreground element with the alpha standing up the the betas tend to be sitting down most of the time and he's blocked in with these guys but with the focal range completely on the on the joker we're again we're telling his story we're putting these guys in soft focus here we're not really saying look at these guys who they are what they're doing isn't important it's what i mean what they're doing to him is important but who they are isn't important so we're keeping the camera focal point on our joker and so we cut wide again to show the aggression. This wide shot's great. These wide shots, of course, are really important. We've been very tight on this shot previously because he's been sitting on the on the on the bench, and they're moving in, and he feels tight. So why do you cut to a wider shot? Is well, we have a very broad action of him grabbing the bag. You really can't see that very clearly in the close-up. So you go to a wider shot to show the completion of the action. And as he stands up, it allows the other actions of them grabbing him and assaulting him to be captured more clearly than that close up. He throws the bag away, the assault begins, and we are back at the Joker. And the great thing about this shot is, of course, that mirrors what we saw in the opening of the movie when he gets beat up. I think he even lands in the same direction as he was in the movie where his head is facing, his head is towards screen left. And the other, to keep the subjective idea alive, the camera is with the Joker, we're in over the shoulder, seeing the, the bad guy here, we have the goofy guy back here smiling again, so we have the alpha male here going for the punch. The camera's low, so we are with the Joker. We're not over here with this guy watching him fall away from camera. We're, we're continuing that action, so let's look at this as he, as he punches in here. We cut on action to the punch. We're keeping the camera low so that we capture the Joker. We're having the cameraman down with the Joker, so we're capturing his story. We're showing him land. We're with the Joker. We're not up with those guys looking down on him because, again, if we were looking down on the Joker, as effective as that would be to make him feel small and vulnerable, we're not telling their story. If we did a shot like that, it could look something like this. If we decided to, to show him hitting the ground, we'd be looking at something like this. If this is the floor of the train, like that, and maybe we have the beginning of the benches right here, and maybe there's a pole as he hits the ground like this.
this could actually be a very vulnerable shot. However, they didn't they didn't do it. And who's to say they didn't shoot that coverage? But this kind of shot, I don't think is making us the audience feel like we're with him in that moment. So what I like about this shot is we're down here on the ground, the cameraman's down on the ground with, with the Joker, and we're seeing his pain, we're feeling that that sense of being taken down with him. So I think that's a great example again of subjective storytelling. Stay down, freak! And they begin kicking him. Now in these close-ups, again, they're doing these great cuts. They get buried in the moments when the lights go out. to get a little tighter to feel him being assaulted. And then the cameraman whips up to see those guys kicking up, kicking him. And then this is the one objective shot in the scene. The camera's really wide and we're not in any way's perspective, but I tell you what I love about this shot. It shows you that he is utterly alone. He's got nobody in this train car coming for him. I love these little elements like the newspaper here and that bag here. It implies that there were people on the train, but they're not there and they're not coming back for the newspaper. No one's coming back for this, this bag of fries. Well, actually that's these guys fries, but no one's coming back for the newspaper. He's utterly alone, and by having this shot back behind these guys, seeing it, behind, see this guy's back, seeing the Joker here, we're not even really allowed to be to, to see what's going on. We can't even help him out. So I love this shot for that reason. And what's great about this shot and what they did here is they didn't show him shooting the guy. They showed the end result of that. I mean, they showed the guy being shot, but they don't show him pulling the gun out. So I love the efficiency and the storytelling in this next shot of them being shot, which is in the escalation of this narrative, in showing that he's been, he's completely bottomed out, in showing that the Joker's getting his ass kicked, we have to have the narrative move forward. And this is the turning point in the movie for the Joker. This is him now taking control of his life and now becoming who he will actually really revel in, becoming the Joker, okay? So before he was I can't remember his name in the movie, to be honest, but he now becomes the Joker in this scene. Now, again, what I love about it, it's surprising. Think about this, everybody. When you're watching, when you're making movies, you're making your own stories, you're working on a movie or your own short or your own story that you're either putting, that you're working on for yourself or you want to put on YouTube, think about the journey and the experience of your viewers. This is your audience. And how do you want your audience to feel? How do you want your audience to experience these events? And this is a great, surprising way of showing us how the Joker has taken his own life in control by taking the lives of other people. We're not showing the gun being pointed. We don't even see the gun showing up in the foreground. We just see and hear the shots. Which is great. And then again, they bury, with the lights going out, a cut to the Joker on the ground. Right there. That's the one shot we see. And then the guy dying. And now the Joker goes from being prey animal to predator. And so in these quick shots here, yes, we're telling this guy's story for a moment. And guess what? It's important to remember that when we talk about subjective versus objective storytelling, and we talk about the idea of whose story am I telling, the storytelling can jump around based on the needs of the storytelling, which means that even though this is the Joker story, the entire movie is the Joker story, we've got to tell this guy's, this, this last guy, the, the kind of the most oafish of the three predators, his story for a moment, showing him going from predator to prey, him screaming in, in pain and realizing that probably this guy really didn't deserve to die, but we have to show him for a moment. So that's why the cameraman and the camera's with this guy for a moment. We have to see him fleeing and we have to understand where he's going. So these cutaways to him in the extra train car are necessary because we have to show him getting away. That's what we're doing. It would be interesting to see if we kept the camera the entire time with the Joker in this train car and only discovered what other train car he would be in by with him running out the doors and looking through the other windows uh, to see, see where this guy is, but they chose not to do that. But I think the other thing about this is these shots of him with the open mouth and screaming, it actually humanizes this guy. I, I mean, I'd be curious to see what you guys think, but I think that it feels like, okay, this guy's an asshole for sure. He's not a kind person. He's drunk. He's he's a bit predatory. He's an idiot. But by him running and screaming in pain now, it makes you feel like, oh, this guy really screwed up. And I feel bad for him. So we got the blood dripping here. 
And now we have the Joker. We have these nice low angles. And what I love about that shot is it sort of makes him feel a little bit more powerful, even though he's wobbling, even though he's been beaten up and he's shaky, it makes him feel very powerful. It makes him feel a little bit more transformed because the camera is lower in these shots. So this shot is great because it is starting to establish that the train is gonna stop. So we need these kind of exterior shots. It also gives a nice little free refresh from being inside the train, but it's actually letting us understand from a story perspective, the train is stopping. So now the Joker's looking around, double checking. Did I do my job right? We have a nice little jump cut, by the way, in here. We go from that that sort of medium close-up to a close-up right here on a cut. And it makes it feel a little frenetic when you have a little jump cut like that. Has the bag, and this guy's screaming. So now we see this guy screaming in pain and also in fear for his life. Doors open up. So now we're with the Joker most of the time. We are with this guy. We see that game of cat and mouse has been reversed. But now we're with the Joker in these shots. And this, this stuff is all great subjective storytelling. We're with the predator to play. We're actually the main predator here. We have the alpha lion now moving towards our prey. Mm. We're over his shoulder. We're focused on this guy. We've got a great sense of composition we've got all these lines of the tracks right here all this stuff is pointing to this guy right here even we're looking at these stairs we see where he's trying to go we know this guy's trying to make an exit and we know he's not going to make it but even all these these posts right here are just a great it's a great composition to focus our eye right here on, on frame so he's moving forward great shot of the of the train leaving and I love this shot of the train leaving we're watching the Joker on the outside but we're also realizing that guy can't get back on the train now he's screwed he has to get away on foot and so this shot to me is artistic for sure but also serves a story point train's gone now forget it dude it's just you on foot again very predatory predatory and I love this wide shot again from the other side of the tracks and then they cut even wider because it shows this guy is completely alone we're tracking with the Joker. We're seeing his determination in these shots. So we're with him. We're telling his story. His singularly focused eye line on his victim. We're with him. We're telling the Joker story, subjective storytelling. And on this wide shot, I love it. It's objective as hell, but it's also incredibly stark and sad because we're so wide. We're showing that there's nobody coming for this guy. He's coming, nobody coming from him. We have the Joker moving on him. He's got nowhere to go. And there's something very vulnerable about this shot when you're this wide. Also, freaking beautiful silhouette action uh, 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 shot here. Wonderfully backlit on this guy trying to climb the stairs. And I feel like what I love about moving past this post in the foreground, it feels like it's almost wiping the screen to the fully transformed version of the Joker. So love this shot. It's not subjective at all. It's objective and it's cold and it's callous and it's not personal. And I think that's what I like about this last shot because it's objective, it's impersonal, and that makes this guy's death and who he is completely meaningless. Who he is as a person isn't important. Who the Joker has become is the most important thing. All right, hope you enjoyed the video. Peace out.